So we are back at our home page and I want to take a look now at the code that generates this home page. So we go to our app folder and if you look at the syntax of the files, you might notice that there are four component files and one app module file. So how does this all stick together? Well, Angular makes use of modules and we have one root module, which is in our case the app module. And inside this app module, we register all our components, but also pipes, which we will discuss in the videos. And we also register all the modules inside this root module. Our own project looks more like this. We only have one app module and we only have one app component. So what does this component look like? Because we had four separate files. Uh, a component exists out of a view which is what we see as the user, which is built in HTML and CSS, which HTML is the markup and CSS is styling. Then we have the class, which provide our view with logic like methods and properties, which is in TypeScript. And then we've got the metadata, which let Angular know that we are building an Angular component and how this Angular component is configured. So we're now back at our homepage and let's take a look at the code. As you can see, we are now at our app component as HTML. So this is what we see as the user. And here we got our app component TypeScript file. And this TypeScript file can actually be separated in three sections, which is the imports and the metadata and the class. So how does, does the tree work? The imports make use of the following syntax. It uh, starts with the import keyword then between curly braces, we place the class that we want to import, then the from keyword, and then the package where we want to extract this class from. So the next section is the component decorator. And the first value of the component decorator is the selector, which has the value app root. And this is used to let Angular know where we want to render our component. So as you can see in our index.html, this app root is also defined. The next key value pair is the template URL with a value of appcomponent.html, which refers to the appcomponent.html file. This is the HTML markup that's used to render our default page. The next value is the style URLs, and as you can see, there are brackets around the value, and this means that it's a list, so we are able to have multiple style files. Our style file now is empty because our default page doesn't use any styling. Also, we have a test file, the spec.ts, and we are going to use this inside this course, so you may as well delete it, but you can also leave it be because it won't really matter. I'm going to delete it, so our project is a little bit cleaner. Now let's go back to our app component ts file and go to our class. And as you might have noticed, there's a title property inside our class, which has the value of my first project. So where is this title property for? If we're going to look in our app component.html file, you might notice this welcome to and then some kind of syntax, title property, and with an exclamation mark behind it. So if we go now to our web page, you see that there is a welcome to and then my first project with an exclamation mark. So how does this work? When we go back to our project, to the HTML file, and we delete the content and just type our double parentheses and the title within it, and save it, our web page will get reloaded, and then you might see the My First Project again. So let's make this a header again, and we do that by adding h1 tags around our title with the parentheses. So let's save that and go to our web page, and as you can see, it's now a header again. So how does this work? If we go back to our project and to our TypeScript file, you see that we have the title property here and our value. And when we change that to test value, you see that our web page is reflecting this value. And this technique is called interpolation. And with interpolation, we are able to render the values inside our TypeScript file on the web page by using the double parentheses. As you can see, we're back in our demo application. And the first part of our website where I want to focus on is our navbar. The navbar is the core of our application and links everything together. Now let's head over to our own application and we are going to take a look in the HTML file. Inside the HTML file of our app component, we are going to add the HTML elements for our navbar. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is add the nav element, which is short for navbar, and I'm going to add an h2 element, which is also known as the header2 tag, which is a subheader with the value of my app. And this is also the logo of our navbar. So the next elements we want to add are the router buttons. And the normal way to do this is by adding an unordered list and adding list items which will become our buttons for our navbar. We will add the names of our buttons inside the anchor tag and this is mostly used for um, when you have to reroute to another page. So if you save the changes in a moment and then go to our web page you can see that our buttons show up in a sort of bullet format. And this is the normal format of an ordered list with list items. And we are able to style these so this will look like the navbar we showed in the demo application. So how we do that is by referencing the nav tag inside our SCSS file and adding, for example, a background, which will be a color at this point. Um, so we're going to give it the pink background. We're going to use for that a hexadecimal code, which is DE4C8A. And as you can see, our pink background shows up. Next, we're going to give our text a white color. And now what I want to take a look at is why this white uh, space shows up above our navbar. And we can do that by inspecting our elements. So if we do right click and we inspect an item, you can see that our H2 is pushing our navbar down and this is called margin and what margin does is add space around our element and we're going to lose this margin by adding our own margin and as you can see we define the h2 inside the nav tags so between the curly braces because it's also structured this way in the html file and we're going to give it a margin of zero which will get rid of all the margin inside our h2 tag so the next thing is that there are still white borders around. If we click now on our body element inside our Chrome console, you can see that it also has a margin of eight pixels. We are going to get rid of this as well, but to do this, we have to define it in our style as CSS. So our body margin and then the double dot zero. And as you can see, our navbar is now aligned with the left top and right of our web page. Now you can also see that there's a small space between our H2 and our unordered list, so we're going to fix that as well. We're going to define an unordered list inside our nav element in the SCSS file, and we will get rid of the margin. And as you can see, it's now close to our my app element. The next thing I want to do is put the buttons alongside each other and for that we need to define our LE inside our L in the SCSS and inside we will set the display property to inline block and if we save it you will see that the items have changed, the elements are now alongside each other and the bullet format is gone. The next thing I want to do is put the buttons alongside the my app so they are on one line and to do that, we have to define for our H2 the display inline block as well. The problem is now that my, our my app element has the full width of the screen and the display inline block will get rid of that. So we add that in our SCSS. But still, it's not on the same line. And that's because our unordered list still has the full width of the screen. And we are going to fix that by adding a float right property to our unordered list. And what this does is it does the same as the inline block. It will get rid of the width, but it will center our element to the right of the container, which is our wall page. The next thing I want to do is give a static height to our navbar. This will make our navbar a little bit bigger, which looks better in my opinion. Now we got the height of our navbar, I want to add some styling to our buttons. And the first thing I want to do is add some spacing between our buttons and we're going to use the padding for that. And what padding does, it puts space between the content and the borders of our element. So what we're going to do is add the padding on left of 10 pixels. So it will add 10 pixels between our border of the element 
and the content. So when we save that and look at our page, you can see there's now a small space between our elements. And if you inspect them, you can see the small space shows a little orange color, which is the padding. So if we now add a padding right of 10 pixels, it will add 10 pixels to the right and to the left. So there will be now 20 pixels between our elements. And we're going to increase that by 20 pixels each, which will add 40 pixels between our elements. So there is now a little bit more space between these elements. Now we're going to add a padding top of 10 pixels and you can see they're now more centered. We also can add a padding bottom, but this won't do much because there's nothing below our buttons. Now let's save that. And as you can see, our navbar updates and it does nothing, but still it's not the same as our original navbar. And we're going to fix that by adding a framework, which is called Bootstrap. So first let's take a look at what Bootstrap is. Bootstrap is a library which will help us with styling our application and also putting the elements in the right spot. So Bootstrap is mostly known for its grid system. And first let's take a look at how this grid system works. So here we got our web page. Um, our app is on the left side and our bird is on the right side. And what Bootstrap does is it puts a grid of 12 columns on our page, as you can see here. So if we give our elements a class of call 12, it will space the element with that class across the whole page or the whole width it can get. If you put a call 8 class on our elements, it will take 66% of the width it can get. Also, you can put a call 8 offset 2 class on our element, which will push our call 8 element to columns to the right. And we're going to use that for styling our navbar. Um, the first thing we have to do is actually install Bootstrap. So we do that by terminating our ng-surf and running the npm install command with Bootstrap behind it. So it will now install the Bootstrap package for us. So this may take a moment, but it won't be that long. So now it's installed. There are still a few steps that we need to do before we actually make use of the Bootstrap. First, let's take a look in our node modules and look for the Bootstrap. And what we want to do is reference the CSS Bootstrap file inside our Bootstrap dist folder. And to do this, we actually have to be in the angular.json file. If you scroll down a little, you see that there is a styles section. And what we have to do is add the path to the bootstrap CSS file inside this section. So when we start typing node underscore modules and slash, you can see the IntelliSense is helping us creating our path. When you type the path completely, you have to run the app again by typing ng-serve hyphen hyphen open. So as you can see, there is already some differences in the styling of our app. But it's still not the same as our demo application. And what we want to do is take this navbar and put a call 8 on it. So it will take a smaller portion of our screen. And as you can see, it now has 66% of the width 8 of the 12 columns. And if you inspect it, you can also see that the call 8 has a 66% max width. So that's great. And what we want to do now is offset the navbar to the right so it will be centered. So we go back to our HTML file and add the offset hyphen 2. And as you can see, it's centered now with two columns on the left, two columns on the right. But we actually want our pink color to be across the whole width. To do that, I'm going to add a div section to our navbar, which I will put all the and a div element is something we use to combine elements inside an element, such as our nav bar. But a div element is not specific, unlike our nav element. Put all our elements inside our div elements. We are also going to take the class properties of our nav to our div. And we don't have to change anything to our CSS file. So if we save now, we can see the changes. 
The next thing to fix our button styling is to add some boldness to our buttons so they pop out a little bit. And to do that, we will add a reference to the anchor tag inside our list items and add a cursor pointer because we want that our web page shows a pointer when we hover, out, when we hover over our items. And as you can see, that now shows a pointer. And the next thing we want to do that for our H2 as well. And I want to add a little bit of boldness to our buttons. And we do that by using the font weight property. And we set it to 600, which will create some boldness, as you can see. So this was the styling for our navbar. So with our navbar done, it's time to put in some data inside our application. And here we got an item from our demo application and how it's linked to our app component file. So as you can see, the image is linked to an image source which will be on url the low lens is linked to the name property which will be a text of type string um, yeah the date is a date property the average is linked to a price property and the description is linked to a description property so how does this property syntax work we start with a name we follow it up by a double dot and behind that a type then an is sign and behind that the value. The same is for the date property, but this makes use of a class which we will discuss in a later video. So let's start by adding these data inside our app component file. So we start with a name and we give it a type of string, which will be a text and we type behind the name of the event we want to show. Now, if you give something a type of string, um, it always knows that it's a text. And if you give it a value of something between quotes, it's the same as a string. So our linter is saying that it is not needed to define the type of text because it's always a string. Now we're going to add the date property. The date property expects a date object and this following syntax is something we will discuss in a later video. And we will add the price which will be 22 and we will add a small description which will be of the value. Legendary legendary artist from all over the world will be together in one place be there and the last property we have to add is the image url so these image urls i will take from a, a website called freepick because you don't need to pay for the images you are well you do have to reference these and comment the author of the image so we go to our web browser and go to the website freepick which is a dot com and we fill in the keyword festival because we are looking for music festivals and let's take one so you can right click on these and you can copy not the image you can copy the image address and we place that inside our quotes so this is everything that we needed to add for one music event now let's save it and go to our web page so now our data isn't showing up because we still have to add the HTML elements to our page. So let's start by defining instead of title the name. Then the next thing we want to define is the date which we will add inside a paragraph tag which is a paragraph. <laughs> so as you can see we can reference these items all by using the interpolation. And we will add a price and description and on the top we will add an image tag and, and the image expects a source which is an URL and we will add here the image source property and we will close it and save and let's take a look at our page and as you can see our data shows up not in the nicest styling but we will fix that later 
So the next thing I want to do is combine these elements we created inside a div, which we will call container. This div class container, which will be the body of our application, as you can see, it shoves our content a little bit from the left of the web page. This is a bootstrap class, which will help us with styling. So our website is more responsive. The next thing I want to take a look at is this source property. Normal syntax for Angular is when you bind directive of an element to a property, we use the brackets around that property. So Angular knows that the value we parse inside this directive will be an Angular property. So we can remove the interpolation syntax and let's save it. So as we know in our end result, we have multiple combinations of these five properties. In the programming language, we can define classes which we combine these properties inside one element or in one object it's called. And so to create an object, what we're going to do is create a new file inside our app folder. And this file is going to be called music event.ts. Inside this music event.ts, we're going to use the export class just like our components, and then we're going to give it a name, which is going to be music event. We open parentheses, and now we are going to define our properties. So what we have to do now is define these five properties inside our class, but we don't give it a value, only the name and the types. So we start by name, dot, double dot string, date, which is of type date, and the price, which will be of type number, the description, which will be of type string, and at last, the image source, which will be of type string. And the benefit of doing this is that Angular now knows when we use this type, what for data to expect. So we define the event, which will be of type music event, which is the class we just made. By pressing enter, it will now import our music event class. And we will give it a value of two curly braces, which will mean that we are going to create an object. The next thing we want to do is add the properties. So as you can see, while I'm typing, it will show which properties are inside our, our object. And this is called the JSON syntax, which instead of a is sign, we will use a double dot to define our properties. So we can copy these. And what we have to do now is remove the types and add instead of a is sign, we add the double dot. And instead of a semicolon, we add a comma. So while we're making all these changes, we are actually breaking our HTML because the references to our properties aren't the same anymore. So what we have to do is add the event dot and then the name of our properties. So event.image source, event.name, event.price, and event.description. We save now everything. As you can see, our page shows up again. So the next thing we're going to do is add the other events. And to do that, we can copy this event and replace the values with something new. And we're going to name this event the event second. As you can see, we get some errors signs the whole time, but there's actually nothing wrong. Also, the web page uh, is showing, so that means that there are no errors, but our Visual Studio code is messing with us at the moment. And I'm trying to fix it, but sometimes a reload of the IDE, which is a Visual Studio code, is something you want to do before you start editing all kinds of stuff which you know is actually right. So we're going to change the data a little. We're going to add no Lola Palooza. Um, we're going to change the date. We're going to change the price and the description. And next thing we also want to search for a new image, which we will again do on freepack.com. So we're going to search for the word festival, which is, and we're going to copy an image again. And we're going to add this URL to our image source. And 
and save it. So now we want to add this event to our HTML again. And instead of event, we want to change this to event second. We're going to copy that and paste it and save. And let's take a look at our web page. And as you can see, we got a second event right here. I'm going to add the other three events now, but I'm going to skip this ahead because this is quite a bulky process. Um, as you can see, I have to change quite a lot of data. And you can do this as well, you, or you can leave it for now. It's not that necessary. It's just that we have a little bit more data to work with. And we're back in our page, and as you can see, uh, we've got five elements right now. And now let's take a look at directives. The next thing I want to talk about are directives. So directives are features for modifying HTML based on data. We have some built-in directives from Angular. Uh, here is a list of these directives, which I will discuss in this video. So we have ng-if, hidden, ng-class, ng-style, and ng-4. So as you can see, we have our data now. And the first directive I want to add is the ng-if directive. So how does this work? So we add the ng-if directive to an HTML element, followed up by an is and then double quotes. Inside these quotes, we add a statement. So event price is greater than 30. If we now look, our first element isn't showing anymore. And if we go take a look in our inspect, we can see that instead of our element, a console uh, showed up. If we now change the statement with our event price is lower than 30, you can see our element shows up back up again. So how does this work? The ng-if looks at the statement and confirms if it's true or not. When it's true, it will show the element, and when it's false, it will hide the element. So in our case, our event price is 22, so it's below 30, so it will show up now. And when we set it back to greater than 30, it will hide it again. If we change this now to hidden, and save, then when this uh, price actually is below 30, it will hide the element. So if you so if we now look in our inspector, you might notice that the element is still there. But instead of uh, removing the element from the DOM, it now has a display of none, which won't show our element. So if we now change the statement again, which will return false, because uh, our price is lower than 30, it will show the element again. So the next directive is our ng class. And I'm going to create a CSS class, which we start with a dot, and then we call red title. And when this class, when you add this class to an element, it will give the text a color of red. So how does this ng class directive work? We add the directive to our element, and then we open two curly braces. We add a name which is aligned with the class we just created in our SCSS file, and behind the double dots, we add a statement again. So let's save that. As you see, this isn't working, and this is because the CSS class I added is not the same as in the SCSS file. It's red title and not title red, so we change that, and if we now save, we can see that our title popped up in red. We can also do this for p tags. So now we're going to use the ng style directive. And what we're going to do is uh, a style is also known as one property inside uh, CSS. So we're going to change the color of our uh, p price tag, and we go to give the value of red. And as you can see, it's not working. Don't forget to place quotes around it because it's a text. 
And if you save now, it's working again. We can also use our backend to define a color. So we can place this color inside our app component and we can give it a value of red. And if we save everything now, you can see that it will also show up as red. So the last directive, but certainly not least, is the NG4, which will help us structuring our application a little bit better. And the first thing we need to do is create an array of type music event. And by adding the block brackets behind our class, Angular knows that we are going to create an array. So an array is basically a list of items. So an array is actually a list of items. We define now a list of music events. And instead of the name and the type that we defined with our objects, we only need to add the value. The type is known by Angular because of what kind of list we are making and the name is becoming a number or an index inside our list. So as you can see, this is taking quite some time. That's why it's always better to think about these things before you start implementing code. So when we're finally done with our array and save again, now our application is broken again because it lost all the references from our HTML to our app component. So what we're going to do now is delete all these divs and we only keep the top div. On the div element, we're going to add the ng4 directive, followed up by is and double quotes. And we're going to define a property and we use the off keyword and then the name of the list we just made, which is events. And if we now save, we see all our events. As you might notice, the ng class directive we used for our first div or first event is now also used for the other events. So you now see some with red titles and some with black titles. So now let's create our own Angular component. The app component is what Angular generated for us, but now we're going to create our own. So what we want to do is place this div inside our own component. And we're going to do this manually. We can use the CLI to generate this for us automatically, but practice makes perfect. So we're going to do and add it manually. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a decorator which will let Angular know that we are generating a component. And inside this decorator, I'm going to define certain properties. If you press Control space, it will show you a list of properties. And the first thing we want to add is the selector. As I already said earlier, the selector is used so Angular knows which component it has to render. And we're going to give it a value of app-music-event. Now the next thing we want to add is a template of a template URL. I'm going to use the template first uh, instead of the template URL. So what is the difference? With the template we can define our HTML inside our component instead of in a separate file. And we can. it's best to do that with using the backticks instead of single quotes. Then we add the export class music event component. And now our Angular is crying a little because we it wants only single quotes and not double. And we're going to use this selector inside our app component HTML. So let's save that and let's take a look at our page. And as you can see, there are some errors. So what it says is that it can't find the app music event selector, so it can't find the component. So if we go now to our HTML file and hover over the app music event selector, we can see the same error. And you see the same error if you hover over the component decorator inside our app music component. Inside our app module, you can see that there are also these three sections. We've got our imports, we got our decorator, and we got our class. Inside our decorator, you can see that there are certain properties, and one of them is the decorations. As you can see, our app component is defined inside of there as well. What we need to do is add our music event component inside this property. So let's do that. It will automatically import the music event component. And as you can see, it shows up again. 
this text is now the same as inside our template, inside our component. So next thing I want to do is actually generate a separate file for our HTML. So let's create that. And we're going to add the div that's inside our app component to our music event. HTML. And we're going to delete the ng4 because we are going to loop inside our app component and not inside our music event. And we're going to add the ng4 to our app music event selector. Now we have some errors inside our music app component because we don't have the event defined. So we define an event of type music event. And somehow this is magically going to work or not. Uh, we still have the template URL defined. Uh, the template selector instead of the template URL. So we change that and we add the path to our HTML file. Now save and we're going to get errors. The problem is here that we need to get the data from our app component to our app music component, which we will discuss in the next video.